after that week of rest and recuperation, I think you're now ready for the next topic, which is linear regression. I've broken up this topic into two different lectures to give you time to assimilate what I'm talking about. But the important point I think is that up to now we have looked at techniques like K nearest neighbors, uh, classification and regression trees, and so on, uh, naive base. All of these have been classification techniques. At least we have used them for classification, although some of them can be used for prediction as well. Linear regression is the first technique we'll be looking at, which we'll be using it for prediction. And of course, I'm sure you remember the difference between classification and prediction. In prediction, we are trying to predict a specific number. What is the price? What is the GDP, etc. We are trying to build a model to, pres to predict a numerical value. Whereas in classification, what we are really trying to do is to accurately try build a model to accurately classify things. Okay, which means that the outcome is not really a number, it is a category. So we are going to say, well, the likelihood that this person is going to default is so much. Or this person we classify as a person who's going to buy our product or not buy a product. Or this stock we classify as one that's going to rise or fall. So all of these are classification problems. So we are going to look now at our first regression or prediction algorithm. Okay, in data mining, we are trying to use available data to be able to classify something or to predict something. Prediction is prediction, predicting numbers or classification is putting something into a category that we understand. So that really is the task in data mining. But what exactly do we do to accomplish this? Right? What is it that's going to help us to accomplish this? So the important point is we are trying to say that we will exploit relationships that we identify between variables and use those relationships to make our predictions. We'll elaborate on this as we go forward. Okay, so here we've got a car, apparently a costly sports car. So now let's say there are two people, A and B. Now, what can we say about whether A is going to be a buyer or not, and B is going to be a buyer or not? Suppose I give you only this much information. Tell me, classify A and B as buyer or non-buyer. Now, given no other information, we really cannot say much. We can say, well, okay, of the general population, uh, let's say 1% of the people have sports cars, and therefore, we can say that the chance that A is going to be a buyer is 1%. The chance that B is going to be a buyer is 1%. Or if we are asked to say, well, I don't want you to tell me the chance. Tell me, is A going to be a buyer or not? And B going to be a buyer or not? All we can say, knowing, knowing the proportions in the real world are no. Neither of them is going to be a buyer. That's my best guess. That's all we can say, given no other information. But suppose A looks like this. Then we can say, well, A is a rich guy. So it looks like there's a greater likelihood that A will be a buyer of a sports car. So if this person doesn't already have a sports car, then given that we know only information about the person's money, nothing else, then we may say, well, uh, maybe I'll predict that this person is going to be a buyer. On the other hand, if the second person B is a tramp, then we can probably say that the likelihood that this person is going to be a buyer is extremely low. So we'll classify B as a non-buyer. Now, what really happened here? What happened is we were given more information and that gave us a better idea, a basis on which to predict. What did we do there? What we really did is we exploited the relationship between a person's wealth and the chance of a person owning a sports car, right? Those are two, two variables. And we said there's a greater likelihood of a rich person owning a sports car than a poor person owning, owning a sports car. So the moment we were, we were given information about the person's wealth, we were able to say, okay, that gives me better information on which I can base my classification. Okay, So this is the sense in which we are saying that 
relationships help us to do data mining. In the absence of relationships, we can do nothing. We can only go by the averages. So regression is a technique that is used for this purpose. And uh, regression is the term that people generally use for predictive techniques. That is techniques that predict a particular number. Okay. Of course, initially regression started just as a specific statistical technique, but the term has become sort of more generally used in the field of data mining to talk about any technique that predicts a number as opposed to classification. Okay, So relationships, so for example, here we've got a family that's gone on a holiday and let's say we are trying to predict how much money they are going to spend. So that's a prediction problem. We are trying to predict how much money they're going to spend on this holiday. It's going to depend on a lot of different factors. What is the annual income of this family? How many days are they going to spend on the vacation? Where are they on vacation? Are they in some inexpensive location in South America? Or are they in a very expensive location in, let's say, Reykjavik in Iceland? We don't know about that. But once we are given that information, that will have an impact on how much spending that we can predict for them. And how far away from home have they gone? Well, it could be just that they've gone to a local county park or they have flown 5,000 miles to some place. So that's also something. And so on and so on. Right? So if we are simply asked what is going to be their vacation spending, we can't do too much. But if we are given values of all these other variables, and if we have historical information about people's vacations, and all of these variables and how much they spent, then we can exploit the relationships between these variables to make our prediction. That is how regression works. So we are really saying spending is a function of, that is, there's a relationship between all of these variables. Of course, I've included only three here, income, days, location, etc., etc. And we're trying to say that spending is not something that is completely independent. It is something that has a probably well-defined relationship to these other variables. So once we know the values of these variables, we can have a hope of predicting the spending. Okay, so we're saying spending is income plus days plus this, but of course, it's not just an addition. You know, you can't add $50,000 uh, a year to five days that they're going on vacation, they are incommensurate, you can't add them. But we could say that it's a function and therefore we can say, I'm going to take this income multiplied by some number beta 1, take the days multiplied by some other number beta 2, take location multiplied by some number beta 3. We'll see how to deal with it because location might be just a place like Rome or Amsterdam or London or Kansas, right? How can you multiply Rome by the number beta 3? We'll take a look at that. Somehow we are able to, if we are able to assign a numerical value to location, then we can just add it. And of course, there might be some other constant factor we add. Okay, so this is what we mean that spending is a function of all of these other variables. So given those values, we can plug in those numbers and you know plug in the values for beta 0, beta 1, beta 2, beta 3, and whatever is calculated is going to be the result that we get for spending. So in this example, what we have done is we have said that spending is a linear function of these variables. By linear, we mean we did not raise income, days, and location to some powers. We're just using them in their first power itself. That kind of a function is called as a linear function. And in this example, we are saying spending is a linear function of all of these variables. Why should you think it's a linear function? Well, it's just convenient, nothing else. And of course, our model, that is beta zero plus beta one income plus beta two days plus beta three location, is not going to be perfect. We cannot expect to get a perfect model. This is not physics, where, you know, uh, like Newton, you uh, discover the laws of motion, apply it, and everything is extremely precise. It's not going to be like that. So there's going to be a small error in our model, and therefore the model is not going to be able to predict exactly. There'll be some deviation, but so long as the deviation is not too big, we'll be willing to accept this approximation. So why linear, as I just said, well, it's just convenient and uh, easy to calculate, easy to explain, easy to understand. But just because all of those things are true, it doesn't mean 
that we are saying that the real world is actually linear. In fact, it's not. Most things in the world are non-linear, but we're just using linear as a convenience. Sometimes people who've been in this kind of modeling for decades tend to forget that we make an assumption about linearity only for convenience. We're not saying that that is reality, but sometimes people tend to miss that. It becomes a religion that linear regression is the only way to go. It's not. It's just an approximation. Okay. So what we're saying is you've got a dependent variable, you've got a number of independent variables, and you've got what is called as the error term or residual. Okay. So this is just some terminology that we use. Okay. So spending, which is what we are trying to predict, is what is called our dependent variable. Why? Because we are saying it is dependent on income and days and location and other variables. So that's called a dependent variable. Earlier in the course, we have used the term target variable. We could do that as well. Uh, and the variables income, days, and location, and any other variables that we may use, they are called independent variables because they are varying independently. Spending is what is dependent on all of those. We have earlier in the course used input variables, the term input variables to describe them. Uh, or you could say independent variables. Very often in the field of uh, regression, people also use the word prediction variables. Okay, so predicting predictive variables, predictors, they use that term as well. And of course, the last term, epsilon, which you're seeing on the right hand side, that is called as the residual. That is the part which the model is not capturing. Okay, the difference between the model's prediction and the actual value is called the residual. Sometimes people use the term error to describe this, but there's some subtle difference between these two, which we'll not really get into in this course. And beta zero is called as the intercept, which is, this is where the, in linear regression, you're really creating a straight line for uh, the, to predict the values. And this is where the straight line meets the axis. That's called as the intercept. We've already talked about why we use linear regression. Why a linear function? Why not something which is nonlinear? And as I've already pointed out, the real world is actually not very linear. Almost anything we look at has nonlinear features. But for convenience purposes, we're going to simply use a linear model. And that's what linear regression is all about. Okay. Now, uh, the first thing to do whenever you're trying to look at linear relationships is to simply eyeball linear relationships with scatter plots. Now, we've already used scatter plots in our course. Uh, in the earlier portion of the course, when we talked about data exploration, we looked at scatter plots. Of course, we can visualize scatter plots only for two dimensions, or at most three dimensions. Three dimensions. Uh, we might be able to make some sense of it, especially with uh, techniques for rotating the three-dimensional object and so on. We might be able to make some sense. For two dimensions, we can directly see linear relationships. But beyond that, beyond three dimensions, there's nothing we can do. Okay, so here, we again looking at our Boston housing data. And we are looking at the two variables, rooms, that is the x-axis, which is indicated as RM, and the price of the, the median price of homes in a particular neighborhood, which is median value. Let's just talk about rooms versus price to not confuse the issue, okay? So here we've got a number of homes which are plotted. Each dot represents, actually each dot represents in this example, a whole neighborhood, but let's just think of them as each dot representing a specific home, just for convenience. That's not how it is in the data. And we can see roughly that there is a linear relationship between the two. As the number of rooms increases, so does the price, assuming the y-axis is the price, but it's not exact. You cannot draw one straight sharp line that goes through all of the points. But roughly speaking, there is a trend that as the rooms increase, in general, the price increases. So that shows us that there is some linear relationship, but of course, we're not going to pretend that it's a perfect linear relationship. looked at these. So simple linear regression, what we are trying to do is to use just one variable to predict another. This is what is called simple linear regression. 
So in this example, what we're going to say is we're going to say we've got an independent variable x, which in our example might be the number of rooms. And the dependent variable is y, which might be the price of the home. Okay, so we want to use the independent variable number of rooms to predict the dependent variable price. So that is what is called simple linear regression. Use one variable to predict another. Okay, so y is the dependent variable, x is the independent variable, and we've already seen that epsilon is the error or the residual. Okay, so let's take an example here. Again, I'm pretending that we are just predicting the price of homes based on the number of rooms they have. So you might have data like this. Uh, one particular home has two rooms, its price was 125,000. Another house has four rooms, its price was 200,000. Another room, a house had three rooms, price was once, etc., etc. Okay, it doesn't mean that all two room houses have a price of 125,000 because right here we see a two, uh, a two room home which is 138,000. Why is that? Well, there could be a lot of other factors which affect the price. We are only looking at, at rooms. Okay, so what we're really trying to say is that our regression equation is going to be price equals some constant which we are calling beta zero plus some other constant beta one times the number of rooms. And this is not going to exactly predict the price. So there's going to be something that's remaining, which is epsilon. That's the difference between the value that our model predicts and the actual price. So this is going to be our regression equation. And in simple linear regression, this is what we are trying to do. We are given historical information about rooms and price. And what we are trying to do is to find the values of beta zero and beta one. Once we have that, we can then use that equation to make predictions of price for future points for which we only know the number of rooms, but we don't know the price. So we can plug the value of rooms into that equation. We already know beta zero, beta one, which we've got from the model, and then we can predict the price. That's really what we're trying to do in simple linear regression here. So that's the equation we're trying to do. So again, now I'm looking at a scatter plot. We've got number of rooms and the price, and the data points we have are all plotted here, right? So for example, this how this particular point it represents, let's say one house, its number of rooms is so much and its price is so much. But of course, you know, the scales on rooms and price would vary. And the rooms, of course, you would have, you know, zero, one, two, three, four, five, just the integral points. And price would be, of course, dollar figure, more or less continuous along the range. But we're not looking at all of those details. We just done the scatter plot of all the houses. And in linear regression, what we are trying to say is we're just going to pretend that there is a re linear relationship between rooms and price, although we know that it won't be exact. So what we are trying to do is to simply plot this line. Find this line for the given values of the data so that for future house uh, houses for which we have the number of rooms, we can make a prediction about the price. It's not going to be exact, but we'll be happy with what we can get. This is what we are trying to do here. So beta zero is nothing but where this line intersects the y-axis. And the slope is really beta, beta one. The slope of this line is what beta one is, which is if the number of rooms increases by one unit, what is the price going to increase by? I'm assuming that the relationship is that as rooms increase, the price increases. Uh, so therefore, when the room number of rooms increases by one unit, what is the price going to increase by? That is beta one, which is the slope. So this is really what we are trying to do in simple linear regression. Okay, and for a given point, let's say we take this particular point here, the actual points price is here, right? The, the real price is really somewhere here. But if you apply the model equation, you get a price which is this. So the difference between those two is what is the epsilon value for this particular point, okay? So there is a difference between what actual value is for this particular point and what our model equation predicts. That difference is really the epsilon value for this particular point, okay? So now here we can, given these scatter plots, there's really an infinite number of lines we can draw through these points. Okay, in the earlier uh, slide, we just saw that a particular line was shown, but clearly this is not the only line we can draw here. We can draw any number of lines. So how do you decide what line to draw between 
these points. Okay, that's really what we're going to be discussing in this. So we've already got the error one for this one. Now for the other point there, we've got its error. For a third point, we've got its error. By error, we mean just the deviation between the actual value and the actual predicted value by the model. The difference between the distance from the point to the line along the y-axis, that really is what we are calling as the error, right? So given any line that we draw, we can, we'll have some set of errors uh, from each point to the line. If the, if the line is different, of course, the errors are going to be different. Suppose you have another line which is sort of uh, closer to, to this point. Maybe the line is going to go like that, right? Then the errors would all be different because the distance from each point to the line is now going to be different, okay? Uh, but of course, what we would like to do is to get a line that goes as close as possible to all the points. Clearly, we cannot get a line that goes through all of these points because the points are not located on a line. So there's no way that can be done. But we want to draw a line that has the minimum possible error. Okay, so we calculate the error for each point, add it all up. That gives an idea of the total error. So we want to, in some sense, draw a line that minimizes this error. That's really what we're trying to do. Okay, so here we are showing all the errors, almost all the errors. One of them has moved away a little bit. All the errors. And we want to add it all up and get the minimum of all of these. So for example, suppose we've got a set of uh, data points, set of homes. So this home has two rooms. Its price is so much, 125,000, whereas the model predicts 135,000. So there, there is an error of 10,000. Okay. The, uh, actual price is $10,000 different, less than the model prediction. Here again, there is a $10,000 difference between the actual price and the model prediction. Okay, so it's price minus model prediction. Uh, whereas in this case, the price is actually higher than what the model predicts, the third, third house here. The price is higher and so on and so on. So this is just all of these errors that are being shown on this diagram. These are all the, the errors. Okay, so in some sense, what we're trying to do is to get that line which minimizes the errors. But of course, what you're already seeing here is that some of the errors are positive, some of the errors are negative. So if we simply add them all up, the positives and negatives would cancel out and we might not get a good idea, right? So you might actually end up getting the error as zero because all the positives and all the negatives, they canceled out and the error was very close to zero. So we may think that the line is actually connecting the points very closely, whereas that may not be the case. You may have a lot of positive errors and a lot of negative errors. Overall, it may be matching, right? So just adding up the errors doesn't make sense. And therefore, what we try and do is to square the errors. That's what you're seeing in this middle box here. You've got yi, which is the actual value of, let's say, the price. And then you've got y hat i. You put a hat on top of y, that's called y hat i. And that is what the model predicted. So the error is actually y i minus y hat, but we know that we don't want positives and negatives to cancel out. So we square it. And therefore, negatives, positives, they all become positive. And we add it up. So we say sigma i equals 1 to n, which means effectively what we're saying is take for every point, calculate this value, the difference between the actual price and the predicted price, square it and add it up across all the points, right? So for every point, we are taking the squared error, error being prediction minus the actual value, squaring it, adding up all of these squared values, and then taking the line that produces the smallest possible value here, right? So as I've already said, yi is the actual value y hat i is the model prediction and we want to choose the line that produces the sm smallest possible value for this. Now that might look like a daunting task because all I've already said there's an infinite set of lines which you can draw through a set of points. You can keep on drawing uh, better lines, keep on drawing it. What we are trying to say is find that line which minimizes this value. You may think, how, how am I going to get this? If there are infinite number of lines, do I just sit down and keep on drawing those lines? Well, fortunately for us, this dude called Newton invented calculus. And using the techniques of calculus, 
you can find out what this minimum line is. We're not going to go into those techniques because we're going to use a package to perform the calculations. So we will just plug in the input values to the package and wait for the package to give us the correct answers. But nevertheless, when you're using regression, you need to at least have an understanding of what this regression is really doing. And that's all I've tried to explain here. Okay, so the criterion that we use is called as the least squares criterion. 